Hey, welcome to another edition of Kyle Meredith with the interview series presented by WFPK at WFPK.org. Consequence of Sound and the Consequence Podcast Network. Thank you so much for uh, making your way here, checking out the series. You know how this goes. If you uh, like what you see, hit that subscribe button. I put out three new interviews every single week. Great way to keep up with all of your favorite artists. And I got to tell you, one of my all-time favorites I get the honor of talking with today, Rain Maida, who you'll know from Our Lady Peace and now with a, a new record with his wife and partner called uh, Moon vs. Sun. Hi, how are you? Hey, Kyle. Good to be here. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. So we got a lot to talk about. And, and one of the main things is this new record. You've done um, a new album called I'm Going to Break Your Heart. Hell of a mm -hmm. title. Because <laughs> it's with your wife, Chantel. Um, and there's a documentary that goes along with it, which is just this amazing look into your all's lives, not just the recording process, but I mean, you're going through, I guess it's therapy uh, or counseling or whatever. Let's, coaching, coaching. Coaching. Sure. Okay. Coaching. That's, there you that's, go. That's what I was looking I, I, I for. Can I, can, I can deal with coaching. <laughs> so what prompted you all to open the doors this wide? Because again, it's not just the making of an album. It's much more than that. Yeah, I mean, you know, the honest truth is so so we've my, my like I I write a lot for other people and produce. I don't do it as much anymore. My wife still does like and she'll she'll go into like a hip hop session and write with Kendrick Lamar or Drake and then, you know, with Gwen Stefani or whoever. And so she's we, we've, we've always been kind of like these opposing forces writing and but it's always around us. And then finally, about probably about three years ago we wrote a, our first song together and it just happened like literally 2 a.m. in the morning. We ended up in the studio together and I had an idea for this chorus melody and she sat at the piano and the song um, came out called I, I Love It When You Make Me Beg. And it was like very personal and we were kind of having fun with it. It was like, damn, this is really good. Like we, we were both as, as artists, like, holy, this feels amazing. Like in the room right there, it was just so like, oh, this is, we have to do something. So we thought, okay, this will be easy. We did this tonight, do this twice a week for the next couple months and we'll have an album. Two years later, nothing. So the only, we, we were talking to a friend of ours who's in the film business here in LA and she was like, look, why don't you film, why don't you, why don't you make a decision to like film the writing and the recording so it's like it puts a timeline on this thing. We tried that, it didn't work in LA. We'd cancel, shit would come up, whatever. And so finally, we figured, okay, you know what? Let's go old school, kind of like, you know, I used to do with my band, and it just doesn't happen as much with technology anymore, but let's go isolate ourselves somewhere. And that way, we'll like book flights, We're still going to film it, but it's like, so now we get to book flights for our, you know, friends of ours who are like directors and DPs and sound and hotels, and we won't be able to get out of it. We'll have to like make good on that. And so there's this little French island, like French France island off the coast of Canada, which sounds weird, but it is. And it's just a tiny little fishing village. And so we booked, you know, a hotel room for there for us and then for our crew and, and film people. And Amy Green, who's a friend of ours, that's a co-producer on the film. And we had to do it. It was a freaking dead of winter, but we had to go there and make this record. And then the long story kind of hopefully shortened is that we filmed writing the songs, but we filmed how we got to those songs too. And then in the edit suite, it was like, you can't take out whether it was a fight or something that happened that was positive it's like it all led to the song crafting and you couldn't like you couldn't disassociate the two so that's the film and it it has a like you said it shows like some of the stress of being partners for a while and having kids and dogs and all that stuff and then trying to write a record as well and it yeah it's it's interesting <laughs> it is interesting but it, it is like the songs are beautiful and and oh thank you and these are like as fans of course this is what we always want to know, right? So it's like, what? how did the song get to that point? But now that yeah. I'm seeing it, like, it's uncomfortable a lot of times. Yeah. But like, I mean, it, it is, but it's just because it, because you're literally like, what's cool about this film is, and I say it as a, like, I love documentaries. I've seen so many music docs, but you are a fly on the wall, right? Like, you're seeing everything. You're seeing, like, I, Chantel says a lyric and I'm like, that sucks. Or I call her stupid and like something blows up and we can't even write for the day because we're fighting about, personal shit but I, I think i think being there and seeing that and even watching it back i mean it's you're right it is there are some parts where it's uncomfortable nothing crazy happens like no one throws a chair at each other no one got hurt so at the end of the day you know i'm here talking to you it's all good <laughs> 
So when you're in the in the middle of it, though, I mean, obviously, you know, there are cameras around. There are other people in that room that, that, that we can't see. How many? I don't know. But uh, at least one holding the camera. And in yep. those moments, those those tense moments, and, and it's hard not to focus on those, of course, the salacious moments. But it's interesting, like there is it seems to be there is a self-awareness in the songs. I wondered if there was a self-awareness in the real human moments though, knowing like she screams at you in the after credit scene, like this is gonna be in the movie. Right, right, right. Yeah, not really, you know, what's funny, I guess, I guess because we had the pressure of like, okay, we did this. Like we, we were like three flights away from Los Angeles on this little island. And so whatever, how many miles, 4,000 miles away. It was like, we were there to make a record and write these songs. And so the pressure on that, I didn't even notice the cameras. And I mean, to be honest, like, you know, it was done with kind of like friends. So basically you can't, you know, because it wasn't like this big crew, you didn't even notice people. They're just kind of there. And, and like I said, it wasn't, it never really worked its way into like our psyches um, on either end on the writing or the personal stuff. And I think that's why it's, you know, like it, it it's very raw in that way, but I, I think that's the way it was meant to be. Yeah. I, d I don't know how you approach like the, um, the artist side of things like like this obviously to me like if you were an artist concerned about the the mystique the character that sometimes yeah. an artist can be it, it does kind of wash away that it, i mean how do you take on that part of of your career i i've you know what i've been fighting with that forever in the sense of like you know we're always on socials now and, and giving people you know more in terms of like what we eat for breakfast this to me was all based on the art this was much more authentic to me because i, I look I, i'll be honest I, i'm not like I do it sometimes. I go in and out of like, hey, I'm gonna post on Instagram or so some something, and then I'm like, I can't stand this shit. Um, but the film for me was like, it was just, it was all about the songwriting, mm -hmm. and so whatever you get outside of that still has to do with the songwriting because that's what we're there to do. So I'm fine. Like I, I, I'm, it's, it's probably weird, but I'm much more comfortable showing a fight that Chantel and I got in that leads to a song than showing, like I said, what someone what I ate for breakfast on Instagram. <laughs> If that makes sense. I no, might, that might sound weird, but no, I get it. But yeah, so, so then we look into the lyrics. Of course, there's one I, I pull, pulled out here. Um, it's a twisted kind of lovers game we play, and that to me is the self awareness parts w within the songs. Like writing these songs, was it obvious that this was all going to be about you? Or and, and I'm taking a, some assumptions there as the way it plays out in the movie that these songs are about you all. Yeah, you're like my new favorite person. That's my that's my lyric. That's my favorite lyric from the from the album because it's true. It's it's so reflective on, you know, we, uh, you know, that first song that I was telling you about that we wrote. The conversation after that was like, hey, if we're gonna do this, we have to rely on like what we have because there's so many like love cliches out there. It's like let's say some real stuff, mm -hmm. and so you know, kind of. Um, agreeing that that was the basis of how we we're going to make this record and things like the song I can change and just kind of like, again, it was all, I, I always go, it's funny, you know, seeing the Bowie poster, like I go back to this quote about art doesn't happen in comfortable places. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we kind of just kept as like the barometer. It's like, if, if this is too easy or comfortable, then we're probably missing the point. Yeah. Well, you talk a lot in the movie too, or several times I should say in the movie about um, uh, the, the conversation way of songwriting you know mm -hmm. I, I do this verse you do you do that verse when you're writing of course with a band it can be one thing when you're writing with not just a musical partner but your actual partner and in this con in this conversational way i mean does that actually change the way you approach a song like how you would usually do that was that different? yeah oh yeah it was yeah for real that's such a great question because it was so like as soon as we tapped into that it's like oh this is actually fun like i can say something and then you're going to respond to me and that dynamic is like, I've never experienced that before. And it's, it's probably different if it's like a scripted thing where, you know, in another situation with two different people, but because we're like actually talking to each other and have like real conversations within a song, it's heavy, man. Like, again, going back to that song, I can change. That's exactly what it is. It's like, I'm, I'm kind of like reflecting on, you know, or what I do that maybe could be improved and, and how to make all of this stuff better. And then Chantel like comes back with like, it's okay. Like not forgiving me, but the, the, the lyric that she says in the course of that song is just like such a, 
such a it's a gesture and it's so powerful and beautiful like i get choked up thinking about it because that was her response it could have been screw you you're you better get your shit together or i'm out of here but it wasn't and so i there's something in that I, like i've never it's just a new experience that's incredibly profound well, you know, so many musicians talk about uh, uh, songwriting as therapy, but this honestly seems a little bit like, you know, uh, you all are talking things out. You're working it out in this, yeah. you know. Yeah, and we're, yeah, and I look, we're lucky because we get to do it through music, you know. Um, other couples and their partners, you know, uh, they have to find what their music is. And I've heard people say that about the film. It's like, wow, it's amazing. We're just, we just have to find what our music is. And I agree because you, everyone needs some sort of vehicle outside of like just sitting down and talking to work stuff out because the 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 analytical part of it is like it's fine but you can't live there all the time like mm -hmm. it's that's that's like you want to live right and so we get to live the music but like you said do a little bit of that kind of like working stuff out within within the songs i think it's when it really gets interesting that you you all use the word versus in the band name instead of the word and <laughs> you know in the in the conversational piece suddenly that's the clash right there it's that's it that's it <laughs> yeah and, and, and you know what i so um moon you know whether it's verses or verse um I, i'm a big uh there's an artist from rhode island called sage francis he's like a you know beat poet um rapper whatever you want to call him the guy is a freaking lyrical genius like more in one song than most you know artist careers like he's just so incredible he has a song called summer's moon and so it 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 touches on the same thing you're saying it's like they're these opposing forces are good i think it's i, I think that's that that's where you that's where you get progress right and whether it's creatively music or in a personal relationship like those you, you need to do that to move forward i think it, I, does your wife feel the same way on that one? Because again, you know, when I look at it, it seemed like she would have in the movie version, uh, again, what I'm seeing here probably appreciated had it gone a lot smoother. But I think that you were really, you seem to be really getting something out of that, that sort of animosity that we're talking about to get to the end product. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad she's not here because she would, um, <laughs> she would say, no, I don't agree with that. But I, yeah, look, I'm, you were a little bit different in the sense of I, I don't know if I've ever written a song when I'm like just happy hanging around sitting in the sun, you know, it just doesn't happen. I'll play a cover, but I'm not going to try to write. So I definitely use that stuff as fuel. But, and I think if she were to like analyze it, she, you know, we would both agree that situation on that little Island, you know, isolated because of the cold and the wind and being forced to just really dig into everything. That's how that music ended up. If we would have stayed here in LA and tried to do it, it wouldn't happen. So yeah, those, those, like, again, going back to those opposing forces there, they are somewhat necessary. Again, you don't want to live there all the time, but you got to dig in, man. You got to dig in and say, go like the Bowie thing. It's, I'd be staring at me. So I keep thinking, but it's true. It's <laughs> like, you got, we, we just knew that we had to get out of the comfort zone because we can sit and write a song and it'll be fine, but it's not going to be special unless, unless you dig in. Yeah. I, I got to bring out my uh, my OLP fandom a little bit because there are, I, I'm guessing, extremely coincidental moments in this movie because there are certain words, you use the word in repair, or somebody does at one point. The I know, isn't that crazy, the coach? The, yeah. Our, like marriage coach? I don't know, I'm like, yo, do I get credit for that? <laughs> and it was there, and, and words like life and hope, you know, there's some more uh, songs of your all's. But it was that moment where I thought, you know, songs change meaning through the years. I don't think I've ever asked the question in this way, though. Do you ever find yourself looking back to your older songs to find answers for now, such as this? Yeah, I, yeah, that that's wild. You asked that because it's such a cool question. I do. It's it's funny, and I never knew this starting, and maybe most artists realize it a little bit later. But you you really learn about yourself through your lyrics because it catch it captures a certain point of time and how you were thinking that way. And then reflecting on it, and it, like it was perfect when you said in repair. Like I, I still feel that way. I feel like we we, and I say it in the film, kind of in the sense of like it's never about perfection. It's always it should be about progress, right? So the in repair thing really relates to that, and the fact that you know our kind of you know marriage coach uses you're always you know you you're we are in each other's care, and and it's our responsibility to be part of the repair process. Yeah, it, it, it's it's kind of uncanny you know the way it's come full circle and um 
it's fun. You know, another thing is like when Chantal and I, we haven't obviously with COVID, but we started playing these songs right before COVID. I think we did two shows, but we'll, she'll play um, not, not anything she's written for like Drake or any of that stuff, but one of her solo songs or a couple in the set. And I pick a couple of LP songs and In Repair is always one because it just fits. Like it just feels like it's so intrinsically part of this journey that we're on and those lyrics are, they just work. So it's, it's funny. That's, that's definitely like a highlight of the show, to be honest, too. Yeah, interesting. And, and of course, the timing, I, I'm going to take the, the obvious pivot right here, because, you know, you just celebrated the 20th anniversary of, uh, of Spiritual Machines. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which that comes off of and, and the new remastered version of that. And, and I hear that you're working on a sequel. Is that, oh, is dude, that right? It is, it is done. It just got mastered this week. And uh, yeah, we did it with Dave Siddick from TV on the radio, mm -hmm. um, who was just a genius. And, so and basically, awesome. yeah, he's just amazing. And he really, again, it's, you know, not to keep quoting the Bowie thing, but like definitely different on, I'm not gonna say uncomfortable because I actually enjoyed being uncomfortable. So I don't know what that means, but um, yeah, it really like it, it it's, I'll, to quote Dave, he's like, this is future rock. Mm -hmm. So, which I was like, oh, that's where we're going. I'm like, drag me along with you man like i'm i'm all in and so yeah i'm re really excited about um yeah just all the new music to be to be honest but the co the cool thing with spiritual machines too is that you know ray's involved again he gives us more future predictions he talks about spiritual machines what he got right which is a lot <laughs> like crazy like percentage is crazy so it's 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 a great reflection but it's also like another chapter um so hopefully you know we can do this in another 20 years and have like the third the trilogy i guess well i mean that was going to be the obvious part of the question here too because you do have 20 years to see what happened what happened from those yep. predictions from all that you know the technology the way it completely rules our life even more than it did then and we thought it really did then you know we have ai bots now creating new nirvana tunes you know and, and... i know man i saw that it's insane <laughs> You know, so so where do you go? Like, I mean, if if you feel like opening the curtain a little bit, like what is the future projections that you're looking at right now? Or do you kind of write some of these songs about the stuff that has happened? Yeah, I think it's more forward thinking. At least I try to look at it that way. And and I think with Ray being involved and giving us a bunch of quotes and talking about like he does, he does comment on spiritual machines, I think once or twice, but the new stuff that he's talking about are things like UBI you know, universal basic incomes, things actually, even singularity for him, because that's really the intersection that he was talking about in the age of spiritual machines is when do we cross this path when we can't tell the difference between a human and, and a machine. Um, I was surprised, you know, it's like, it's, and, and, and I, it's weird because the record that we made with Dave has more of this kind of upbeat, um, I don't know, colorful, positive thing where spiritual machines one was a little bit darker, and Ray's predictions, like when you think about singularity, you think, oh, wow, it's going to get a little hairy and maybe dark. But his stuff is all really positive, even in terms of technology, like being able to save, you know, third world nations and, and food crises and poverty and hunger and stuff like that. So it's it's all kind of it's all good in a way, which is mm -hmm. which is amazing, because um, I guess there's so many dystopian films out there that, you know, portray the future as, you know, Terminator 5, 5 or whatever it is. But it's, it doesn't it doesn't feel like that. And the music kind of supports Dave, which or or sorry, Ray as well, which is kind of cool. No, that's that that is a surprising part because anytime you talk about, oh, I'm making a a piece of art about the future, we all expect that it's gonna be dark. What right. Does that exactly, say about all exactly. of us, you know. What is that? I know, man. I know. <laughs> Especially after this year, like Jeez. good lord. <laughs> uh I, I should say one of a, a much less I don't know the word I'm looking for, a dystopian version of a of interesting technology is NFTs. And that's become something that you've mm -hmm. kind of taken a stake in too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so it was really, it started all off with, I, I joined a company out of Seattle called Sing to help them kind of transition in the music space in terms of IP protection. They started as like patents and inventors and it was just, you know, it wasn't like a huge scalable thing there. Um, so with music, you know, we have young young boys that are musicians and are on TikTok duets, creating like way more, you know, in terms of like intellectual property, original ideas than I ever do. Like I'll maybe do two or three records a year. So 30 or 40 ideas. My kids will do that a week. Like they just get on there and have fun and collaborate and they don't care about IP or even understand it. For them, it's all about like clout and followers. Right. Mm -hmm. So 
but the, it, it is like original works. It's original lyrics, it's melody, it's, it's hooks. I'm like, damn. And some of this stuff is really good. You know, I don't know where they get it from, but it's like, they're, they're super talented. So it's kind of like, Hey guys, the, the whole sing thing was like, we need to help this next gen of creators. The thing is we, the way we built this, this digital wallet, um, that's like on the app store has been for, for a minute, anything you upload in there, a voice note, a picture, a video, a song, whether it's just a beat or a finished song in a studio, it all gets on the Ethereum and the blockchain. We've always been creating NFTs, but it's only like the last three weeks that people know what an NFT is now. So, and the, the, you know what, Kyle, the crazy thing, it's like, I don't know if you've been following it. So for the OLP first single, we have uh, Nadia from Pussy Riot features on it. Again, Dave produced it. So we're like, what can we do that's really cool? I've always been a fan of people. Mm -hmm. So we were talking to people like three months ago, but hey, will you do a video for our first single? It's called Stop Making Stupid People Famous. He was like, sure, I'll do it, of course. And all of a sudden he starts ghosting me. And we had like two Zooms like this. It's like, what should the concept be? He's like, oh, this is crazy. I got it. Give me a second. I'm going to write it out. Then, we'll, then I'll start work. I was like, this is crazy. This is like my favorite people from all these different spaces now are on this one track. And then he ghosted me. And it's like about a week later, you see this, the whole NFT, like he's, people is literally the curve. Like when you see that big jump and what people are seeing and, but he's brilliant. He's a great artist. And I'm going to guilt him like on these interviews that, Hey Mike, at some point, man, you got to come <laughs> back and, and do good on that promise to do a video. But I, I think it's amazing for, for creators just to get back to what it does. It's going to give us all superpowers, like connect direct to our fans with this kind of new cool economy. And it's, it's pretty dope. Yeah, especially, I mean, seriously, as everyone tries to figure out how to make money as being a musician these days, and here's yeah, man. something that seems to be working, even if everybody can't grasp it yet. Like, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I use it, I use the Patreon model, because I know a bunch of bands that are on Patreon and do subscriptions, and they make, you know, they help sustain a living that way. Mm -hmm. When you think about like 80% of, yeah, 87% of music, musicians and artists like live like $4,000 above the poverty line, like this is going to actually impact artists in terms of wow you know what i can go do this and make a living and i don't have to have three other jobs and it really is that patreon model is great what pledge used to do in terms of crowdfunding it's like now you can go direct to your fans and build a community it's new distribution it's new monetization without any of the gatekeepers that is pretty cool yeah no that's beautiful that's beautiful congratulations on that uh, getting a part of that i know that's cool but uh, especially i want to say uh congrats on this record with uh i'm going to break your hearts I've sort of it's I've become a little bit obsessed with it this past week. Oh, sick. Yeah. Thank you. I, I am. I, I, it, look, it's one of the most pure, authentic things I've ever been involved in, you know, and, and it's it, it's one of those things that's just so it resonates so much talking about it, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you feel that. And it's, it's pretty cool. I appreciate it, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, as I wrap up here, I quickly I want to do I want to apologize for something you have no clue about, by the way. But this is my uh -oh. uh, this is my fan story right here. I'll wrap up with you came to Louisville. Uh, this would have probably been during the gravity tour. Uh, if I had to guess, you played a little club called Jillian's and we were there and um, I was there with my friends and I had brought the first album with me. Maybe I don't remember if I was trying to get it signed or whatever, but I wanted you to play hope so bad. Oh, and I kept jumping up and down and I was just being an annoying fan, I think, but you looked over at one point and you were, I don't remember what song you were in the middle of, but you were kind of jamming out a song and you started injecting the words to hope. And I oh, thought, oh, wow. that's amazing. That's cool. And we were happy. And I was young and I was an asshole probably. And then I looked at my friend like two minutes later. I said, like, but he still didn't play it. So we have to keep yelling it. And I remember you looked at me later on. You're like, dude, <laughs> I got you, man. I got you. <laughs> you got me. I was like, oh, man, I went too far. I pushed it too far. It's hey, look, I was, I, I'm glad I was able to even just do that for you. That's <laughs> that. You caught me. You caught me on a good night. <laughs> It was fun. Rain, thank you so much uh, for all the music, especially for this new record, too. It's been a lot of fun talking to you. Thanks for taking the time. Oh, dude, I appreciate it. I can't look, can't wait to get back to Louisville and get back on the road. Hopefully yeah. that's sooner than later, man. Absolutely. We'll see you then. And I look forward to uh, Spiritual Machines, uh, Spiritual Machines, too, as well. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. All right. Take care.